This lecture is an introduction to the clinical laboratory and was filmed on November 18th, 2020. So, laboratory testing is not a standalone thing. Laboratory testing is used along with the health history and physical examination to diagnose the patient's condition. Um, it provides objective and quantitative information regarding the status of body conditions and functions. What does objective mean? What's that? Uh, so in, um, in, in other terminology, yeah, but in, in medical terminology, objective is going to mean factual. The word objective means factual, like true or not, based on the past. So an easy, answer, an easy one, heart rate. I always go back to heart rate. It's an easy one to talk about. An adult heart rate should be between 60 and 100 beats per minute at rest. If I check your pulse and it's above or below that number, objectively, your pulse is not normal. Yeah, that's objective. Quantitative is kind of the same thing. It gives us, if you should have a blood cell count that's in this narrow range and it's above or below that range, we've counted your blood cells and they are either above or below the normal range. Quantitative um, answers on lab tests are, uh, gives you a, a, a quantity of something. It tells you how much of this substance is in your bloodstream. The other version is called qualitative. Okay. Qualitative testing is the type of testing that they're doing for COVID right now. It tells you, you do have COVID or you don't have, excuse me, you do have the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-2. Okay. You either do have that or you don't have that. It doesn't tell you how much of the virus you have. Okay, you test positive for the, it's a, yes or no. it's a yes or a no. Qualitative is yes or no. Quantitative tells you not yes or no, but how much. Uh, that's going to give us information regarding the status of body conditions and functions. Next are some term, uh, terms that become important for us as we go on here. Uh, we've You've seen, I've given, I've given this term before, we'll use this term again, um, homeostasis. The word homeostasis is an interesting word because it, in effect, means same, same. Homeo means same, right? As in, um, as in the word homogenous, okay? A homogenous thing, like this wall, is very homogenous all the way across the room. It's the same type of wall all the way across the room. Same texture, same made of the same stuff, same color, all the way down that wall. That's homogenous. Um, if we had some crazy paint job on the wall, we would call that heterogeneous, made of many different things. Okay. Um, homeo, from, uh, from the term uh, same, and then stasis. Stasis also means the same, but it means the same more as like staying in one spot, stasis. Homeostasis is this idea, it's this idea that there's this um, level at which the body is functioning most efficiently, right? You're, you're bringing in the right amount of, of, of nutrients, you're using those nutrients in the best way possible, and you're excreting the minimal amount of waste possible, right? Um, we all, have, we all know like old cars which just spew out junk out of the exhaust, right? They're being very inefficient, right? They're not in, in, a, in, a, in any good version of homeostasis. Homeostasis is this uh, idea that your body has a tendency to find this like middle of the road, normal, efficient, here's where we should be. Anything that's not that is a, is a condition, it is unhealthy. So this idea that our body is always trying to reach homeostasis is, is an important concept for medicine. Um, if that's true, if, if you're in homeostasis, you are healthy. The internal environment of your body is said to be, and this is, a, I think, from a physics standpoint, a bad word, equilibrium. Because equilibrium means that just nothing's happening. We know nothing. We know that it isn't true that nothing's happening. We know there's lots of things happening. Um, Equilibrium was a thing like I talked to you guys about last time where we had like a box of gas, right? And I put 2,000 particles on one side of the box of gas and zero particles on the other. And then if I poke a hole in the middle between the two boxes, 
they split the, the thousand and a thousand, right? Then they get to equilibrium and nothing happens. It's more like the body is working most efficiently. So the in, I would say the internal environment of the body is at its most efficient, working at its best when the body is in homeostasis. We're, pro, we're at us all being young and healthy and, and we're not, none of us are sick right now. None of us have any major acute diseases. I would say for the most part, we're all about as homeostatically balanced as we can be, okay? Um, you know, everyone's got their little things, right? But we're about, about this point in life, we're about as healthy as we're ever going to be, right? Uh, we're as close to homeostasis as we can be. Um, the way in which, because homeostasis is sort of subjective. Your version of perfectly functioning is not the exact same as mine. But if you pooled all of us together, there's like a ballpark range where we should all be pretty happy if, we're, if, our, if our levels are all in this you know, middle range. For that reason, they've established what are called reference ranges for things. When I quoted the adult um, heart rate a minute ago, that was a reference range. 60 to 100 beats per minute at rest is a reference range. I check somebody's heart rate and then I go, what's the normal? I refer back to that, bless you, I refer back to that range to go, what's normal? Okay, We call that a reference range. All laboratory tests have reference ranges that you can refer back to. So you don't need to be like, they don't just give you a number and you get to go decide for yourself if that's high or low, right? They give you a number, a quantitative number, and you get to look at the reference range. And then from that, that's what determines if a lab is within a normal limit or outside of a normal limit. If we are not in homeostasis, this may be because of a pathological condition. Uh, pathological conditions cause alterations in body substances. So you have changes in the chemical content of the blood or urine. Your antibody levels may be up. Um, your cell counts may change. For example, during an inflammatory or disease process, you would see like white blood cell counts going up because the white blood cells uh, counts increase when we need to fight an infection. Cellular morphology, cells changing their physical shape and structure in the presence of a disease. These pathological conditions, by the way, pathological takes the root of the word pathos, meaning disease. Pathological, disease process. Uh, may result in abnormal values of laboratory tests. Pathologic conditions cause abnormal values for specific tests. The example given, iron deficiency, uh, iron deficient anemia causes alterations in red blood cell morphology and a decreased hemoglobin level. level. Uh, maybe, maybe put a note next to the word hemoglobin. Maybe not have heard it before. Hemoglobin is the part of the red blood cell that holds oxygen. the part of the red blood cell that holds oxygen. Also worthy of note, the word hemoglobin literally means blood protein. Heme or hemo for blood. Globin, globin is the combining form for protein. So if you see globin, used as a term anywhere, as a part of a word anywhere, you can pretty well bet they're talking about a protein. Alrighty, the laboratory test. This is a clinical analysis and study of materials, fluids, or tissues the sample specimen, as we call it, uh, is, is obtained from the patient um, and that specimen assists in the diagnosis and treatment of disease. <clears throat> the type, uh, like the category, the uh, in this case, they call the classifications. Um, in any case, the uh, category or classification of test depends on the specimen you are using to do the test. So the root 
word will tell you where that specimen's coming from. For example, hematology. Okay. Hemato for blood. Okay. Ology. By the way, if you didn't know this already, ology just means as a suffix means the study of. So the study of blood is what hematology breaks down to mean. What type of specimen do you need to perform hematology testing? Blood specimen, right? Now, within the umbrella of hematology, you have many different hematological tests that can be done, and the way you collect the specimen varies from test to test. So exactly how that specimen is collected and stored and transported varies from test to test, but hematology means blood collection. Clinical chemistry, uh, essentially just looking at chemical levels. Um, immunology and blood banking. Okay? Immunology deals with um, our antibody levels. And blood banking deals with storing, uh, storing blood from people who have... The one that's come up lately in... in um, not even that recently, but we've heard of, of convalescent plasma. Right. If you if you follow the news at all on the coronavirus, they talk about giving people's people who have recovered from coronavirus giving their blood to people who are currently sick with COVID. You heard of that? Well, it, so blood transfusions happen already when people are sick. Blood is given to them to, uh, from healthy people. Right. This uh, when when you get sick with a virus, your body develops antibodies to the virus. Little little um, I like to describe them as little flags that your that your body puts on a virus, and, and that way, then when the virus is cruising around in the body, it's wearing a flag, and now your white cells can go attack it. It's got a flag, and everyone can see it. They can go attack it. That's the easy analogy. Well, people who are sick, who have been sick with COVID, uh, will have antibody levels that are higher, and if they donate their blood that blood can be given to a sick person and automatically just give the person passive immunity to the virus. Seriously? Yeah. You can give somebody immunity to the coronavirus by giving them the blood of somebody who has already had coronavirus. It's called <laughs> passive immunity. Active immunity is the immunity that you develop when you like for example when you get the flu or if you get if you've had coronavirus Active immunity is your body going, oh crap, we've got a virus in here. We better ramp up production of antibodies, right? Instead of doing that, passive immunity just pushes all that into the body. We just take it from someone else and give it to the sick person. Um, blood banking is done for that reason. At least right now it's being done for the reason of coronavirus, as well as a lot of other things. But that's the reason for blood banking and immunology. The other reason for immunology is like, you know, you want to go get a job and they're like, all right, you need to show us proof of your MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You all got it when you were a kid, unless your parents didn't vaccinate you. Um, you don't have your vaccine card. Do you have your vaccine card? Do you have your vaccine card? Do you have your vaccine card? Oh, I do too. We all have our vaccine cards. Some people don't have those. Okay. And if you don't have that, the only way to show proof that you have immunity to something is by having what's called a titer test done, T-I-T-E-R, titer. Um, the titer test is an immunology test, and it looks at your blood and goes, Do the, does this person have immunity to such and such thing? Okay. Like measles, mumps, rubella, or hepatitis B, or any number of the va polio vaccine, any number of these vaccines that we get growing up. Um, immunology is the way to look at our levels. Before I went into radiography school, I had to have my MM I had to show proof of my MMR, and I actually um, didn't have immunity anymore. When they did my titer test, I didn't have immunity anymore. So then I had to go and start the vaccine series over again, and then boom, they did the titer test again, and my immunity level was up. <clears throat> Next is urinalysis. Uh, we've talked about urinalysis. Um, we will talk about it more this Saturday, but urinalysis is the um, chemical and physical analysis of urine. Microbiology. Microbiology is the study of the very tiny. Okay? We are a big thing. We're a macroscopic thing, but there's way, way more small things in nature than there are big things. And those are micro um, microbes is one way to one way to one thing to call them. They're microbes, 
the study of them is called microbiology. Remember, as we were talking a little bit earlier about the urinary system and, and Escherichia coli, E. coli, the, the thing that causes the urinary tract infections, that's a microbe. Okay? We can perform microbiology tests on, uh, on a urine sample, for example, and uh, determine the presence of that bacteria. It's called a urine culture. <clears throat> Other types, I think there's, God, there's a couple type, a couple repetitions here, but other things to consider, um, parasitology, okay, what word do you see in there? Parasite, right? Um, think like um, intestinal worms, that kind of thing, you've heard of them? Mostly with like dogs and stuff, right, but people get them too. Okay. Um, that's what those are parasites. One reason why you need to cook pork all the way is because pigs carry parasites. Okay, they carry specific uh, like intestinal worms that you can get yourself if you don't if you eat uh, uncooked pork. Okay, they're in the food for one. By the way, you're eating them already. Um, but when you cook the it's gross, right? When you cook the <laughs> your eyes but, when you cook the pork when you cook the pork you're just killing them. That's yeah. all. They're there. They're there to be. You eat so many little things all the time that you'll never ever notice unless uh, unless that. unless someone tells you you're gonna eat it. Yeah. Yeah, I happen to really like pork too, but you got to make sure it's cooked. <laughs> got to cook it, and it's got to be hot. It's got to be, in my opinion, it's got to be eaten right then. You know, I'm not eating cold pork. Not going to. I mean, I know it's dead, but I'm not going to take that chance, right? Yeah. There, yeah. Like, it sure, it's cooked, well, you know. But like, yeah, it just doesn't sit. Doesn't yeah. sit right. It doesn't feel right to you. Yeah, you know. If it, if it, if it trust, trust your intuition, right? Yeah. If it don't, it doesn't feel right. <laughs> yeah, and everyone's like, it's so good. I, like, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Trust your intuition on that one. Um, cytology. Cytology is the study of cells specifically. Cyto is the combining form for the word cell. Lastly, histology. Anyone want to take a stab at what that means? History. Yeah, it's so weird. It's not history at all. It's not nope. All. It's skin. Hmm? Yeah. Histology is a study of skin. I know. That's why I asked. Because <laughs> I, I have to remember that one myself because it's like it doesn't have any easy way to remember it. Histology, study of skin. That's yeah. I mean, dermatology technically, is, but like the lab tests on yeah. skin specimens called his, histology. All right, next up. Okay, so um, laboratories. <clears throat> laboratories can be in a physician's office or they can be a, a, an outside laboratory. We call a doctor's office laboratory a POL. Physician's office laboratory. Most physician's offices have some version of a laboratory. It's might be small. They might only have like a strep testing machine and a flu test machine and they have a urinalysis machine, right? But they have a laboratory in most cases. The deal is the tests that are performed are called CLIA waved tests. We'll get it later in this PowerPoint, but CLIA stands for the Clinical Laboratory Improvements Act. It was... Um, an act, a federal uh, act pushed through in 1988 that set forth standards for the ways laboratories can perform their tests. So if a test is considered CLIA waived, it does not have to follow the CLIA guidelines. Meaning a regular person medical assistant, you know, somebody who is not specifically licensed to do laboratory testing um, can perform these tests. CLIA waived tests can be performed by medical assistants. <clears throat> Good examples here, blood glucose. If you know somebody who's diabetic and they, and they have had their glucose taken, uh, or if you've seen them poke their finger and check their blood sugar, that's a blood glucose test. We use that same exact equipment in a medical office. 
Urinalysis is another example of a CLIA waived clinical laboratory test. It's just such a common thing um, to do a urinalysis in a physician's office. It's so easy to get urine and it's so easy to test it. The machines are, they're not cheap, but it's not like the cost of, you know, paying for a contract with outside laboratories and such. It's, it's not, not a big deal. Clinical laboratory improvements amendments. Um, so this is going to be our CLIA uh, regulations. So these are regulations developed by the federal government. So this is not at the state level. This is the federal level. The goal was and still is to improve the quality of laboratory testing. And again, this is federal, so it just applies to the United States. <clears throat> We as a medical assistants, I don't want to say don't care, but we don't have really anything to do with CLIA tests at all. Anything that's CLIA um, required is not something we work with. So we talk about CLIA waived things. So what, it, what it the heck is a waived test? It's a laboratory test that has been determined to be simple and easy. Simple and easy go hand in hand there, right? Easy to perform. <clears throat> it has a low risk of erroneous test results. So to make it simple, uh, CLIA waived tests are tests that are easy to work with and hard to mess up. Jessica can attest to this, and I can attest to this, you guys, and I think uh, uh, Marilla can too. Um, there's so much to do as a medical assistant to begin with. If you asked us to do very complicated laboratory tests and have special certifications to do them, that's a lot to put on top of everything else a medical assistant has to do. So medical assistants are only allowed to perform. It sounds like a limit, right? I, I see it as a good thing. Yeah, I see it as a good thing that we're compartmentalizing what people can do. You wouldn't want a medical assistant to have to run an entire laboratory and do all the other things a medical assistant has to do. So waived tests are a way of uh, giving us, you know, easy, having a way to get easy answers to common things um, in the office cheaply, and a medical assist assistant can do it. That way we don't have to utilize outside laboratory resources and... Um, it keeps keeps us from having to do things that are very uh, potentially a lot more difficult and a lot easier to mess up. <clears throat> All right, the next, um, some laboratory tests require the person to change their lifestyle for a short period of time. One way, one thing to do, one possible preparation for the testing could be fasting. Okay. Yeah. Why did they tell you you need to fast for ultrasound? So that way there's not like old gas or anything like that in the way. They don't want any any. Yep. They don't want any junk in the way of what, of what they're looking at, right? For us, for laboratory testing, we want um, we want the levels of chemicals in the bloodstream to be normal. We don't want them to be like, we don't want them just to have eaten a Big Mac, right? And then go in an hour later for their test and have, you know, uh, sugar levels up, cholesterol levels up. We don't want that, right? Does it matter? Because there's times when I've gone in to get blood work done, but I've never had to Oh, yeah, no, not every um, blood test needs this. Only certain ones. Uh, for example, ones that test on your blood sugar, um, ones that test on certain enzymes will will they'll be affected by the uh, by eating prior to the test. Um, yeah, but th there are a lot that just don't matter. Yeah, like if you went in for like just a blood count or something like that, doesn't matter, don't have to be fasting. But like a metabolic panel, a comprehensive metabolic uh, profile, the CMP that we talked, the first one we talked about, that one you got to fast for because all your uh, organs start changing their levels of things when you eat. Uh, so fasting, we'll, we'll define fasting on, on the next slide. Um, so we'll, let's say this. Uh, it's required for some venous blood specimens. That's one of the most common um, reasons to fast prior to a test. 
The composition of blood is altered by consuming food because the digested food, what I commonly just refer to as the nutrients, remember macronutrients and micronutrients, those nutrients just, they end up in the circulatory system. So they're hanging around in our bloodstream. Until they're used or stored by our body, they're in our bloodstream. And if we take a blood specimen, you're going to get those substances in the specimen. Um, so, for example, you get food intake resulting in falsely high readings for things like a fasting blood glucose. Okay. So what is fasting? Fasting is abstaining from food and fluids, except water. Everyone forgets this one, except water. Remind your patients because they will forget the definition of fasting. If you tell them don't have anything for the 12 hours before the test, they may think they can't have water. They should be hydrated, okay? They should be well hydrated. It might depend on why the test is being run, but in, in almost any case, water is going, going to be allowed. Yeah, you're going to want them to have, make sure they drink water. Dehydrated people have very hard to find veins. Their veins could whoop. Okay. So, it's, <laughs> so you want them high. I do not like when I get a dehydrated fasting person come in and I've got little mush for veins and I can't like poke at a vein and get it to get it to become engorged and it's harder it's much harder plus you just you want them to be hydrated it's people shouldn't be dehydrated um oh you know, yeah yeah you know they, they they shrink and they harden yeah they make it make it harder to find and they harden them yes um uh, fasting 12 to 14 hours of nothing except for clear liquid water Not that there's really anything wrong with like ice chips or something. It's just that's yeah, the, that's I the definition. Obviously, when you eat the ice, it's it's water. just it's just the definition. <laughs> oh. It's for definition purposes. Because I heard that too. That I'm like, oh, you can't drink anything, but you can have some ice. I'm like, oh, ice is water. Uh, um, that's to keep you from that. That's during uh, childbirth, mm -hmm. right? Is that when that happened? Oh, okay. Well, it, it would be for surgery. Before yeah. surgery, too. The reason they do that is to keep you from taking in large amounts. Yeah, because I would get, like, super thirsty, like, a really bad yeah. amount. And I was, yeah. Like, so, like... Can I drink anything? Or, like, no, we can have ice chips. Right. Like, so, pic picture, picture yourself drinking water. How long does the water hang out in your mouth? Not very long, yeah. right? You drink it, boom, it's down the gullet, in the stomach, adding the fluid to your body, right? When you take ice chips... They have to dissolve and they moisten your mouth rather than go into your digestive system right away, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a way of allowing you to kind of moisten your mouth but without taking in a bunch of water. Yeah, so uh, that's, that's the reason. Yep. Um, specimens collected in the morning. Um, food from the evening meal uh, would be completely digested and absorbed. Um, so they can eat their evening meal and get the test done sometime in the morning. Um, this is the least inconvenient for the patient. This is the best way to do it, right? Tell them to go home, have your dinner. After dinner, don't eat anything else. Your lab test is scheduled this, this time next morning. That's the best way. Um, and guess who's responsible for all of this? This is the medical assistant's responsible for this, okay? Uh, the doctor goes, here's what test I want done. The MA has to know what type of preparations need to be made for the test and what, it, what, what of that, what instructions need to be relayed to the patient. Remember, speak with your patients at a sixth grade level. We do not explain to, need to explain the full reason for the fast, just the fact that they need to fast. Um, Ensure the patient understands to abstain from both food and fluid except water. It, it is advisable to drink water. This prevents dehydration. Okay, so prevents dehydration. And uh, in case a urine specimen is required as part of the testing, you want them to be hydrated. You want to make sure you relay to that patient when to start fasting. Okay. 
Okay. And what time do they report for the collection of the specimen? Here's what you need to let your patients know. You need to let them know these things and let them know, don't be rude, but let them know if they don't complete uh, the instructions as they're required, um, that one, their lab tests, make sure that they know their lab tests can be false, falsely high or low. Because um, if they think nothing's gonna happen, they might not pay attention to you, right? So one, your lab test could be abnormal for no reason, falsely abnormal, okay? Two, guess what? You're going to have to do this over again, right? Anyone can decline anything anytime they want, but if, if they want that test, if they want the answer, they're going to have to do it over again, right? So make sure you relay that to them. You know, one, there's no value in an abnormal result. You got to do it again, which means if you had your blood drawn, that means you have to go back for another blood draw, right? No one likes that to begin with. Um, so make sure they know those things. Make sure they're aware of the, the um, problems with not uh, adhering to the advice and instructions. All right, next up, we talk about medication restrictions. Let's, let's talk. So, uh, many medications affect the physical and chemical characteristics of body substances. I think as I was asking earlier about like what should be included um, on the lab requisition, uh, you mentioned allergies. I don't know, maybe medications got mentioned, yeah. but in, in any case, it may be important to include the medications that the patient is taking on at least the patient's record, if not also the requisition. I, at least with the requisitions I do, I don't do that, but the, the chart, the patient's record has that on there. Um, so examples uh, of um, medications uh, that throw off test results. If somebody's on an antibiotic therapy, and they're on that therapy, they're on an antibiotic before a throat specimen is collected for strep testing, that's going to give a falsely negative test result. They still have strep throat, but the levels are low, too low to test for because they're on an antibiotic. Patients are typically told not to take certain medications before collection if, if, big if, okay, big old if here, if this does not cause a health threat or serious discomfort to the patient. Any medications that are life-threatening or cause severe discomfort should not be discontinued by the patient. Guess what the qualification to that is? Unless the physician says so. Well, it says on a lot of medications it says like if it has like a bad effect or if it's causing too much like nausea or whatnot yes. to make your physician know. Absolutely, you got that. They're the they're the they are what are called the licentiate of the healing arts. They're the one who does the healing, right? They're the one who needs to make the decisions on the healing that's happening. And if they need you to stop the medication to get an answer on a lab test, then that's what it has to be. Um, so some advice. If, you're gonna if they need to discontinue a medication, if it's gonna be for a urine collection, two to three days. 48 to 72 hours before collection for urine. Somewhere in between four and four hours and one day for blood. And uh, medications more likely to interfere with urine results than blood. Blood changes happen quick, urine changes happen slow. Again, if patient cannot be taken off of a medication, that medication should be recorded on the laboratory request. The laboratory may be able to use an alternative method of testing. So alternative methods are a possibility. This is a good time to either know a lot about the lab alternatives or 
you can call the lab. It's my favorite thing to do is call the lab, ask the lab techs. They know all the stuff. Okay, they're going to know what to do. Um, and they, that's their job. That's part of their job is to answer the questions that the doctor's office has about testing. So you can call them, you can get answers. I've really never had a problem speaking with laboratory techs uh, or supervisors. They're always really helpful in, in figuring out alternatives or um, special ways to collect things that are different than the standard. So call the lab if you're ever in question. If the test is performed in the medical office, the MA should consult the manufacturer's instructions for medications that interfere with the test. Inside the packaging for every new box of tests you get for whatever test it'll be, there's an insert. That insert gives you all of the important instructions and considerations to take when performing whatever test that is. And it is always the physician determines what medications to discontinue, if any. The MA ensures the patient understands. Where the doctor says it, we relay it. All right, so let me ask it like this. How, how best do you remember what happens in class? What is said by me or what's written on your papers? Written. written on your papers, right? You don't go home and remember every word that I say. If you don't write it down as I'm saying it, you're going to have a hard time recalling it. Unless, of course, like it was something that just, you know, struck with you and really, really, you know, made an impression. But not everything, not everything I say does that, right? Some things, hopefully, but not everything. The way you remember things is by written instruction, copying what I say, yeah, right? Because you just go back to it and... Exactly. You can't, your memory's not, you know, your memory's not a computer, right? When you recall something I said in class, you're just doing your best to recall what it was. You don't have an exact copy of it. But when you write it, you do. So for your patients, same thing, okay? It's like, it's like me talking to you. You're not going to remember everything I say, but you hopefully will be able to read what is written down and remember it that way. So written instructions are always better than verbal instructions for your patients. If you can give them written instructions, you should do it. All right, next, next and getting towards the end of this. Collecting, handling, and transporting. All right, so I've said specimen several times. Here's the definition. Small sample or part taken from the body to represent the nature of the whole. So it's a little piece that represents a bigger picture, the rest of the body. For example, to do a DNA test on you, we just need some of your blood. Mm -hmm. We don't need every cell in your whole body, right? Mm -hmm. We need a little bit of it, specimen. Uh, most lab tests are performed on easy things. What does the body let out easily? Urine, feces, sputum. What does the body let out under certain conditions? Blood, cervical and vaginal scrapings. Those are all things that the body can let out. Probably the easiest thing to get to is urine. Feces is, is second on the list, okay? Um, but is typically done by home collection, okay? Um, I, I can, let's, let me put it like this. In the days that I spend in my urgent care, I do many urine tests in a day. Many, I don't know, dozens, I don't know, a lot. A lot of urine tests in a day, right? I have only ever personally collected fecal samples probably a handful of times, okay? Um, that paints the picture that feces is rare to collect in the clinic. Urine is very common to collect in the clinic, okay? Sputum, okay? Sputum is another um, thing that can be tested. We don't typically test sputum in the clinic. Uh, most of the time when we perform these CLIA wave tests in the clinic, we're gathering um, cells from the uh, either the uh, throat or airway or something like that. When the coronavirus test is done, a nasopharyngeal swab goes way, way back there. 
We're collecting. The people go, why the hell are you going to go back there? Why can't you just go to my nose? Coronavirus in my nose too, right? Well, yeah, but no. We want the cells that are in the back of your airway because those cells are most similar to the cells of your lungs where the coronavirus is going to be affecting. Gosh, if we could stick that tube all the way down into your lungs and collect some lung cells, that would be the best. Okay, But we can't, so nasopharyngeal is the next best. Um, in any case, lab tests are going to be performed on things that are easy to get a hold of. Okay. Uh, but easily obtained. Uh, sample of secretions or discharge for microbiological analysis can come from these areas. Nose, nasal, nasal, nasal turbinate, or nasal pharyn nasopharyngeal are options to collect from the nose. The throat, called the pharynx, uh, pharynx collection is typically done for throat cultures. Uh, determining what bacteria is in the throat. Wound cultures are the same idea. Collect some microbiological specimen from a wound. Ear and eye, vagina, urethra. Um, I noticed they're not, cer cervix isn't on there. I guess it's probably not considered one of the easy ones to collect, but it's a really common one to collect. So these are our... Um, Easy to find, easy to get to, easy to collect, easy to provide a specimen for. Not so easy to get to. Gastric juices. Those are in the digestive system. Cerebrospinal fluid. You've probably heard of a spinal tap before. Okay. The correct word for that is lumbar puncture. And they collect cerebrospinal fluid. That's one of the only ways, for example, one of the only ways you can detect meningitis. Okay. Meningitis is an inflammation of a specific uh, layer of uh, around the brain and spinal cord, the meninges. Pleural fluid. Pleural fluid, um, you guys should know this. Where's our pleura at? Uh, almost around the lungs. Yeah, you're, you're in the right part of the body. Yep. Uh, it's sort of around the heart, so you're not wrong. Um, so pleural fluid. Uh, the pleura fills up with fluid sometimes when we're sick. We call it a pleural effusion. And we, we, meaning medicine, doctors, draw with a big, large syringe, a big, large needle. They stick it into the pleural space and draw out the fluid from that space. That procedure, we talked about it. What's it called? The removing of fluid from the pleural space. Yes. What part of the body is, are we taking fluid out of? The lungs, which are in the thorax. Thoracentesis. Thoracentesis. All right. So a thoracentesis is, is, is done to remove pleural fluid. Peritoneal fluid. Today, not more than two hours ago, I told you what the peritoneum is. <laughs> What's the peritoneum? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's hard. You guys are you guys are learn something and then you're moving on to new things. I get it. Um, so remember uh, or remind yourself that the peritoneum is the um, connective tissue covering that separates the inside of the abdomen from the muscles of the abdominal wall and those of the pelvic floor. The peritoneum, it's a wrapping that wraps everything in the abdomen. Um, if there's fluid within that space, peritoneal fluid can be aspirated. Synovial fluid, okay. You have synovial fluid. To look at every little joint in your body, everything that moves, okay? There is a sac between every little joint, doesn't matter how small it is. Even in your ears, the little bones of your ears have synovial or synovial joints. Little sac full of fluid called synovial fluid. It cushions and pads your joints so when you move, you don't go, ah, 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 right? Everything is padded, right? Synovial fluid. But if I bump my elbow or 
bump my knee really hard on something, I can burst that sac that holds the synovial fluid. And then there becomes this swelling. It's usually in the, that's why I'm showing my elbow. It's usually in the elbow. It comes becomes a swelling, and then people get this like double elbow or just big old massive bubbly looking elbow. And you touch it, and it's really soft and squishy, and it looks like a ball of squishy elbow stuff. Physicians will come and they'll stick a needle in, and they will aspirate. Aspirate is to pull out that fluid. They'll aspirate that fluid, and they can test that fluid for the presence of infection. Okay. You, you've, ha you've had it done? No. You've seen it done? Often. Yeah, you've done it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so synovial aspirate is, it can be tested. Do they send it off for culture or did they just, sometimes they just draw it out for pain relief. Other times they send it out. Yep. Um, so that's, uh, you got fluid. Everyone's got fluid in all the different parts of our body and we can collect those fluids. It, it, it's like always going to involve sticking a big needle in and pulling the fluid out. Um, tissue specimens for biopsy. They will take a piece of tissue, uh, either from like skin or from deep inside the body too. You guys, once you're well trained for ultrasound, you may be assisting with ultrasound guided biopsies. You're going to be using your ultrasound and a physician will be looking at the screen, sticking a needle down way deep into the body. And you're using your ultrasound transducer to show them where that needle is going so that they can hit the right spot and collect the right tissue sample. It's a big job. Um, yeah, your thyroid. That's right. Um, so tissue specimens for biopsy. Yep, that's uh, sometimes done under ultrasound guidance. Cool. You've gone in and you see the needle and you're like, uh, mm -hmm. I was not and then like, like they numb it and they, yeah, I mean, you can still feel it and then it's like, it's a big needle. Yeah, it's not, it's not small. It's like yeah. 18 gauge or maybe bigger. Yeah, yeah it's not small. Um, and then they just go in. Yeah, no, believe me, when I saw it, that's when I was like, oh crap, this is like serious. Is that yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys will develop a, st if you don't have it already, you'll develop a stomach for this stuff. You yeah. know, you've got to, you, yeah. you've got to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, the, that's the mentality. That's the mentality you should take is this is, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah. Like, okay, this is kind of interesting. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So I would say all of this, except for maybe like no, I would say all of these ones on this page are physician collected. Okay, the ones back on this page, we can collect a lot of these. Here's what we definitely cannot collect. We cannot collect vaginal discharge. A physician must do that. We cannot collect urethral discharge. So vaginal and urethral discharge are off limits. We also are forbidden from collecting tissue specimens. You can't biopsy tissue on your own, or at all. You can, you can stand there and they take it after they collect it and label it and all that, but can't do it. The MA assists with the collection. So it's off limits to the MA, right? That is correct. We cannot collect them. They must be collected by a physician. Okay, so that talks about all of the um, laboratory uh, testing information up to the point of collecting, handling, and transporting the specimens.